Hello. Savadika, and welcome from the University of Oregon. My name is Leslie Ott Beckman, and I'm on faculty here at U of O with the Linguistics Department and the American English Institute. We're here today to talk with you about some exciting new opportunities in a new collaboration between University of Oregon and Thailand in the area of science and math education. To begin, I'd like to introduce you to University of Oregon President Dave Fronmeyer, who will help launch today's session. Hello, my name is Dave Fronmeyer. It is my privilege to serve as President of the University of Oregon, and it has been our great honor to welcome Her Royal Highness Princess Pachura Kitiyapa Mahidol to the University of Oregon. Her Royal Highness honors us with this opportunity for the University of Oregon to convey our deepest respect and admiration for the life and service of His Royal Majesty King Bhumipong Adulyadet on the occasion of his Diamond Jubilee year. Her Royal Highness honors us with her visit, with her friendship, and with her commitment to education. Thank you for inviting us into the homes and the country through the Royal Thai Television. Last summer, my wife and my youngest daughter traveled to your wonderful country. We saw the beauty of your nature, the vibrancy and energy of your cities, the richness and glory of your culture, and the friendship and goodwill of the Thai people. Through that time, we also witnessed the wise and loving leadership of the King, His Royal Majesty, that he has shown to the people and to the world. And so we wish to congratulate again His Royal Majesty as he celebrates the 60th year of his accession to the throne. This has been leadership worthy of the more than 6,000 years of Thai civilization in its language, its art, its culture, architecture, and religion. It is among the oldest civilizations on this earth, and we deeply respect its teachings to us all. We are so pleased to see the dedication to education that is primary in our interactions with the Thai people and with the royal family. The commitment to the education of the people of Thailand is making a continuing and a profound difference as we are in this modern world. The dedication to these partnerships in education, I know, will continue to make a difference. His Majesty the King has set an example of involvement by the leader of a nation that should make any nation proud. The close relationship that we now celebrate between the Thai people, the peoples of Eugene and Springfield in Oregon, and the University of Oregon here is part of that effort. The Royal Thai Distance Learning Foundation works to realize His Majesty the King's vision of excellent education for all Thai citizens, especially those in the rural areas of Thailand. Last summer, when my wife and daughter and I visited Thailand, we personally watched this effort of the Distance Learning Foundation in action. We visited the studios, we visited the schools in which the students were learning, and we saw how profoundly admirable these efforts are. And it is for those reasons that the University of Oregon is particularly honored to be a partner of the Distance Learning Foundation in this so important message. Distance learning programs have been developed here by Leslie Op Beckham, who appears with me, and by other faculty members of the American English Institute at the University of Oregon, and now increasingly other departments as well. We are developing new math and science programs for the benefit of this foundation and for the benefit of the Thai people. This partnership enriches us all as a community, as a university, and certainly in our relationship to the Thai people. Our partnerships and friendship has been more so made more solid and more enduring by the visit of Her Royal Highness, and we thank her and her father and His Majesty the King so deeply for the honor of this visit during this Diamond Jubilee year. We trust and hope that this visit continues to cement the friendship that education can serve throughout the world, and particularly the relationships between our two peoples. We thank you most profoundly. We send you our congratulations in this Diamond Jubilee year, and the University of Oregon send its warmest wishes to all the people of your country. Thank you. Thank you, President Fronmeyer, for those welcoming remarks. We appreciate your support here today. 
Um, it is now my very great honor on behalf of the University of Oregon to introduce a very special guest, if I may be permitted, um, Her Royal Highness Princess Pachara Kitiapa Mahidon, who is here to dedicate books to local and university libraries and to open an exhibit honoring the Diamond Jubilee celebration marking the 60th anniversary of His Majesty the King's accession to the throne. At this time, if we may, we invite uh, Your Royal Highness to make some remarks on behalf of the video conferencing project. Sumdit Pabaram or Sadhirat, Sayamakut Ratsakuman, Song Prakaruna, Blood Grab, Blood Gramom, Hai Kapatao, Mapadibat Prakar and Yakit Tan Praong, Nakan Perkitakam Klong Gansuksat Hanglai, Pandao Tiam, Visha Vitia Sad. และคณิตศาสตร์ระหว่างโรงเรียนวังไกลกังวลในพระบรมราชูปถัมป์และมหาวิทยาลัยโอเรกอนในวันนี้ข้าพเจ้ารู้สึกยินดีที่ได้ท
Welcome back. As President Fonmar mentioned, we have had the opportunity to not only welcome Thai dignitaries and faculty to Oregon, but also to experience some of Th Thailand's beautiful countryside, warm culture, and incredible hospitality ourselves. Please join me next in viewing some video with highlights from recent travels. Next, I'd like to introduce you to another member of our travel team and an important figure in the creation of this collaborative adventure, Dr. Russ Tomlin, Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. He's going to talk to us some more in more detail now about some emerging opportunities for University of Oregon to work with Thailand in the areas of green chemistry, physics, and math education. Over to you, Russ. Thank you. To all of our colleagues and friends in Thailand, please accept our warmest regards from Oregon. It is an auspicious time for Thailand, and I would like to begin by conveying our congratulations and our respect to His Royal Majesty King Pumipon Adulyadya on the occasion of the 60th year of his accession to the throne, the diamond jubilee of his wise and loving reign. It is indeed an honor for us at the University of Oregon to have participated in a visit by Her Royal Highness the Princess Vajra Kitiaba Mahidong to dedicate library collections graciously donated by the palace to the cities of Eugene and Springfield and to the University of Oregon and to participate in the opening of this new video conference series in collaboration with the Royal Thai Distance Learning Foundation on mathematics and natural sciences. We here in Oregon are also grateful to His Royal Highness Crown Prince 
Maha Vajira Longhorn for asking His Royal, Her Royal Highness the Princess to represent him on this occasion. And we are grateful to our colleagues in Thailand for the collaboration we have enjoyed under the leadership and direction of Grand Chamberlain Tan Kwan Keo Vajarodaya. The University of Oregon collaboration with the Distance Learning Foundation began several years ago with the development of the first video conference series for Thai teachers on advances in English language education. That series has continued to this day under the academic direction of our colleagues sitting with me here, Leslie Opp Beckman from the University of Oregon, and colleagues from the Distance Learning Foundation and Chula Longhorn University. On this day, we launch a new series, one dedicated to teacher development activities in chemistry, physics, and mathematics. Like the English language series, this too is a collaboration between the Royal Thai Distance Learning Foundation, the University of Oregon, and Chula Longhorn University. It is our hope that we can all work together to help realize the vision of His Royal Majesty the King for improved and universal education for all Thai citizens. His Royal Majesty's commitment to education is known worldwide and is making a profound difference in the lives of many people. His dedication to our partnership in education will continue to make a difference in all of our wonderfully interconnected lives. The first video conference today will feature contributions in three areas. First, we will hear about green chemistry. Green chemistry is a new direction for teaching chemistry that reduces the need for complex and dangerous chemicals in laboratory education while continuing to teach all of the fundamental concepts and processes of chemistry. Second, we will introduce inquiry-based instruction in physics. Inquiry-based instruction engages students in the discovery of physics principles and their applications in everyday settings. Finally, we will discuss current ways in which mathematics instruction is integrated into the teaching of physics. I am grateful to University of Oregon faculty, Dr. Kenneth Doxey, Dr. Jill Baxter, Dr. Dean Lively Brooks, and Dr. Julie Hack, and to co colleagues from Chula Longhorn University, including Dr. Supawan, Ajahn Supawan of the Chemistry Department, and Arjan Surapong of the Wang Klaikong Wan School in Hua Hin for their creative and innovative efforts on this project. It is very much of an honor for the University of Oregon to work with our colleagues in Thailand to produce this first video conference event in science and mathematics. And we hope you will find it engaging and useful in your professional practice. We thank you in advance for all of your hard work and we are grateful for the opportunity to learn from our colleagues in Thailand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tomlin, for your remarks today and for your support of this project. We couldn't, be, couldn't have done it to this point without you. Um, please join us next in viewing a video that shows an example of some of the work being done with green chemistry here at the University of Oregon. It features two of the leaders in this field, Dr. Ken Doxey and Dr. Jim Hutchinson. Uh, we'll have an opportunity afterwards later in the program today to talk a bit in person with Dr. Ken and learn a little bit more about his plans for the future with Thailand as well. And now the video. So tell me about exactly what green chemistry is and when was it, uh, when was it invented? Well, it's been uh, growing over the last five or ten years in the research areas, but it's really only coming uh, into fashion and the teaching uh, realm most very recently. Uh, here it came about because we're trying to solve some problems with overcrowding in our teaching labs and uh, the green approach allows you to to uh, teach in a different style which I'm sure we'll talk about some more. Yeah, why don't, yeah, why don't you talk about that? Why okay. You, yeah, what? Uh, well, uh, our overcrowding here is a result of uh, increased enrollments and smaller laboratory spaces which were uh, safer laboratory spaces, but um, they only allow us to teach about 17 students at a time. And so the idea was to try to find a new way of teaching organic chemistry lab 
that allowed you to teach on the bench top like we're showing here. Mm -hmm. And so tell me, what, how does green chemistry facilitate that? Well, in traditional reactions, yeah, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Can you go ahead. Traditionally, the, the types of things organic chemists work with, chemists in general work with, are, are oftentimes toxic, mm -hmm. irritating, mm -hmm. perhaps volatile, flammable, uh, dangerous to work with. Um, and as a result, we traditionally have always had to carry out our work in, in well-ventilated areas, better ventilated than a, in a simple room like this, mm -hmm. but in particular using what we call fume hoods, and there are a series of those around the lab here that perhaps we'll be able to see. Um, you'll be able to see also these fume hoods aren't enormous, mm -hmm. and if they were enormous and they're certainly available, then there are costs associated with that that are, that are difficult to bear, yeah. particularly pragmatic things like, like air handling, mm -hmm. um, heating of rooms in the winter and whatnot. It's difficult to have too many students working in fume hoods all at one time. As a result of that, that's why we've been limited, despite the nice laboratory we have, to, to holding only 17 students at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can work on the bench top using chemicals that are less toxic, less volatile, less hazardous, less irritating, uh, laboratory space is, is still at a premium, but mm -hmm. we can certainly handle more than 17 with the available space. Now, I, wasn't there a, was there a female professor who a number of years ago was, was, was beginning to work in this area at the university? Is that, is that true? Do you know about this person? In the general chemistry track, uh, Deborah Exton has Deborah for, Exton, right, for yeah. several years been working to make the materials that they work with in the general chemistry lab safer I see. Uh, for use. Mm -hmm. And that, that effort has been going on for some time. Mm -hmm. So that's general chemistry, and you're talking about organic mm -hmm. Right. But, the, right but that yeah. does highlight what we view as, as the future for chemistry, and uh -huh. that is these, these concerns, worrying mm -hmm. about student exposure, worrying about environmental exposure to, mm -hmm. to hazardous substances are, are valid concerns. Mm -hmm. They're not going away. Right. Uh, and it's our hope that within, I'd say, 10 years, maybe sooner, um, chemistry at the University of Oregon is simply going to be taught with an environmental consciousness. Mm -hmm. It will still be chemistry. Students will still learn the fundamentals and all the details that they mm -hmm. need to learn, but there will be a cloak over all of that of concern about how chemistry is done. Can you give us an example of how, how it works? Green chemistry? Certainly. Yeah. And why yeah. don't you start? You've got one, a nice one. Yeah, so uh, the whole idea with uh, organic chemistry is that we do reactions typically, and so uh, there are we always start with some material, something that we want to convert from one chemical to another chemical, and we use some different reagents which act on the starting material and solvents which dissolve everything and make the reaction possible. And so what we did in developing the curriculum is target usually the solvents and the reagents and to try to find greener alternatives, more environmentally friendly alternatives to those reagents and solvents. And so in one example, we are using, uh, rather than a, a corrosive, toxic reagent bromine, which causes severe burns, we've substituted for that a nice solid that's easy to handle that slowly releases bromine into the reaction and therefore uh, reduces the hazard at every stage throughout the reaction. Mm -hmm. So that's one example where we can change the reagent and make the reaction safer. Mm -hmm. um, Solvents, most of those are volatile materials, and so those evaporate into the room. People breathe those if we use them. So solvents are another area where we've really made a big effort to try to eliminate the real hazardous solvents and replace those with more uh, safe solvents. For example, ethanol, which mm -hmm. I think most people would agree is a pretty safe material. Has using the green approach compromised in any other way? The, the, the information you wanted to give your students on the way on chemical reactions? That was our, our students' concern when they first started. Last year when we first taught the course, we, we hand-selected 15 students. They knew what they were getting themselves into, uh, and they were very receptive. Mm -hmm. This year we, we recruited 30 students who thought they were just signing up for organic chemistry laboratory. I see. They knew nothing about the, the green track. The first day of class, they were simply told to stand up and follow that man in the back of the room to, to their new lecture hall. And there was a lot of, of reluctance I see. Think. Concern about just what you've mentioned. Uh -huh. there, there are things we need to learn. Oh, these are these are maybe pre-meds, and they're they want to make yeah. sure they get into right. They, they For take, example, they yeah. take their exams, and suddenly there's one that's not going to. They get tested on something that's not 
that they don't know anything about. That's right. There are mm -hmm. certainly career tracks where you're expected to know yeah. the basics. Of so the tell me about that. So what, what, uh, One of the best ways to show you the approach that we're using is to compare it to the approach that's being used traditionally around the country, at least traditionally for the past 10 years or so, when people move to what's called micro scale. The idea was to reduce exposure uh, by working with smaller quantities of materials. And to work with these small quantities, special glassware was devised, which looks more or less like this. Uh, it's, it's neat. It's cute. Uh, it does the job, but it's completely unrealistic when you compare it to how chemistry is really done in the world, which is more traditionally, say, with an apparatus like this. These are both set up to distill a liquid, something many people are familiar with. This one works with tiny quantities, collects tiny quantities. This works with more realistic scales and materials, and in fact can be scaled up easily to, to, well, by comparison to what I'm showing you, giant scale, but in chemical industry this would still be a, a baby brother to the types of apparatus that would be used. So not only are we teaching the environmentally benign issues, but as well uh, we're able to give students experience with practical, realistic glass. We're preparing them to really move out into the chemical industry uh, and, and solve real problems. A side benefit as well is, is since we're working with small quantities, a typical student from a microscale approach would, would maybe end up with a little bit of a compound and, and, and that's okay, that's chemistry, but it's, it's somehow it's intrinsically more interesting to really end up with enough to see and to work with. And the students really seem to turn on to that as well. We've tried to evaluate that in a couple of ways. So uh, in the first term, just to make sure they're on track, we give a practical midterm rather than a paper midterm. Mm -hmm. So they actually come in here and they have to demonstrate that they know all of the skills that are common to both green chemistry and the traditional organic chemistry yeah. laboratory. So I think that's one good indication. And although we've only gone through one whole year, um, the, the students who exit green, green organic chemistry often go into a third term of organic lab that is uh, common to both. Mm -hmm. And last year, the students who went on from the Green Organic Lab did really well in the, in the final term. Mm -hmm. So I think both of those, those indicators suggest this is teaching them the skills they need to have, but it is certainly giving them a lot more. Mm -hmm. So uh, this course is not being taught anywhere else right now in this approach, this Green not approach. Not that we're aware of. Uh -huh. There are certainly departments that are, that are trying to introduce perhaps a green experiment so uh -huh. they can teach not the whole the concept, not the whole the whole no in fact the I, whole there, way. there are those that that would suggest that that we're at least doing things the most difficult way and, mm -hmm. uh, and that is taking on the whole task at once instead of gradually phasing in we're, we're, I just, see. we're just doing it uh -huh. uh, and the reason is that we think it just has to be done mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are also a real advantages to bringing in uh, doing it all at once because you get an economy of, of the scale there, the lecture materials that you use that you have to introduce uh, for one experiment, um, you, you end up getting paid back if you do more experiments mm -hmm. later on. So, mm -hmm. yes, uh, I, Yeah, go ahead. You know, just an interesting observation. And, you know, why, why are we interested in doing green chemistry? Well, we started with the very pragmatic, practical reasons trying to, to have a reasonable number of students in a laboratory, but it's, you know, the importance goes so far beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly does relate to global environmental issues. And what I find interesting is that uh, oftentimes you would, you would suspect that perhaps academics or students for sure would be on, on one side of an environmental argument and the chemical industry would be the ogre on the other side. And in this particular case of green development, it, it really seems that industry is, is, is beating the academics to the punch. Hmm. That they've, been, they've been worried about environmental chemistry or chemical concerns for, right. for longer, clearly, than, than yeah. we've been teaching about them right. in the universities. And I'm sure they want to change their image, don't they? It's I a, mean, well, you know. we can certainly get into the reasons. It's yeah, a, well, I'm not, bottom, I'm, not, I'm, not saying it, I'm not saying it, you know, it's a world of angels out there, but it, understandably they want to change they, their image. They, they and want the reality, the too. And they want the PR. They want the PR, and yeah. they also, it's also cheaper. Ultimately, uh -huh. it costs more money to dispose of a chemical yeah. than it does to buy it in the first yeah. place. So these companies realize the bottom line is uh, on the side of green chemistry. Well, talking about PR and that sort of thing, I mean, what kind of media attention are you getting for this? This is obviously a, a great uh, match, the University of Oregon, given this state and, yeah. and, and what it's known for in this, in this program. What kind of what kind of attention? I'm surprised you haven't been on Nightline. <laughs> we, uh, we've got <laughs> waiting outside. Yeah, we, we've gotten a lot of press, but uh -huh. uh, 
uh, both uh, local, obviously, there have been a number of newspapers that are interested. Uh, in an, on the national scene, we've got uh, a piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Oh, great. And uh, Chemical Engineering News ran a short piece on this. Um, but uh, we've also received some international attention. There's an international journal, Green Chemistry, that mm -hmm. uh, has run a, a story on it. And uh, the Green Chemistry Network has featured us on their web page. And so there, there is a lot of interest. And you know, Ken and I are ending up getting emails from all over the country wanting to know how do you establish this curriculum. So uh, that seems to be attracting everybody's attention. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, it's a, it's a noble, uh, noble endeavor. And uh, I, 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 I'm sure the trend will catch on. And you pioneers are going to be responsible for, uh, for spreading the, the word. So thank you very much for uh, having us in your shop here today. Well, thank you again for coming. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. Thank you. thank you for that interesting example of green chemistry at work. As I mentioned before, we'll have an opportunity later in today's program to talk with Dr. Doxy and some of the other U of O educators and scientists that you're seeing in today's tapes. But first, let's take a look at a second example from another scientific setting, this time combining physics with math education. Note that in both examples, University of Oregon educators are using an inquiry-based approach to teaching science. This model works well with students of all ages, not only the ages that you're seeing on the videotapes. It closely mirrors the methods that scientists use in actual experimental settings. Coming up next on video, an inquiry-based approach to physics and math education with Dr. Dean Lively-Brooks and Dr. Jill Baxter. Watch closely for a fun and easy to make device that Dr. Dean has built called the World Cup Soccer Kicker. And now, our video. Greetings, I'm Dr. Dean Lively Brooks and I teach physics at the University of Oregon. I'm Dr. Jill Baxter and I teach in the College of Education at the University of Oregon. Today we'd like to talk to you about a method of science instruction that is both authentic and exciting. It teaches science as a process rather than a collection of dry facts. In fact, it teaches science using the process that scientists use to actually understand and explore our world. So to outline today's presentation, the first thing we'd like to do is talk a little bit more about inquiry, define what it means, and then we're going to have an example with us today, which we call World Cup Soccer Kicker. And we'll be talking about our example. And finally, Dr. Jill will be talking about opportunities to actually do mathematics instructions that fold into our science inquiry instruction. Mm -hmm. So first, what is inquiry? What is the inquiry process? Well, scientists, when they study the natural world, they pose a question that they want to answer. And then they think about, what are the variables that are involved? What sorts of things are changing, what are not? They would refine their question into a hypothesis using their understanding, their previous knowledge of science. And then using their hypothesis, they might make a prediction as to the outcome of an experiment that they design. They would design the experiment. They would take the data. They would analyze the data. And then they would actually possibly revise their hypothesis if it wasn't correct. Mm -hmm. So that defines the inquiry process. And today, we're going to actually do this by example with this wonderful device, if I do say so myself, that I created. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> I call this World Cup Soccer Kicker. Now, to make this device, I took my wife's old bicycle and I took the front fork off the bicycle, and I cut the tire and the rim away and the spokes. And then I set it up as, as a pendulum. I made this soccer leg out of wood and this foot, and I attached a mass. And I could change this mass. And this acts much like a pendulum. It, it, depending upon the height I, I lift it to, it kicks the balls in certain ways. And then down here, I have a CD. And that is the pedestal for my soccer ball. So I can put the soccer ball right there. And I can actually kick the soccer ball using this apparatus. Ready? All right. And now on this flat area here, I've put down something. This is actually baking soda, but one could use sand. 
And in my sand pit, it actually marks how far the ball went for me, so I can make measurements. My baking soda. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so using this apparatus, we can explore a lot of what-if scenarios for inquiry point of view. And um, <clears throat> I think the very first thing we would do following the inquiry model is we would ask a question. So, Dr. Joe, I'd like to ask you to ask, what is our question going to be? Well, I think it's important to look at how high we're putting that, moving that leg up. If we're moving it a lot or a little. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this would be a lot up to here or a little. And see what kind of a difference that makes that for how far the ball goes. So how far, the, how far the ball goes. So we're exploring, we're asking a question, what does the initial height of the foot mm -hmm. do to the distance the ball travels? Right. That's, that's our question in some sense. And what's the ultimate goal here? To get a goal. To get a goal. Okay, right. We want to kick the ball farther and perhaps get a goal or something. Okay, so that's our question. And then the next thing we might do in this inquiry process is we might think of some of the physics knowledge that we already have coming into this and how it relates to what we're doing. Okay. So what do you think? What do you think, what sort of physics knowledge do you think will be useful in our scenario right here? Well, I think force will think be very force? important. Force. So that would be the force that the foot, foot. exerts on the ball, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So are there any other physics concepts or ideas that you think might be useful here? Well, I think there's some energy. Energy. Ah, Changes right. going on here that are important. So we might say, what kind of energy do we have right now with the foot held up in this position? That would be potential. Potential energy. That's right. Gravity, potential energy. Gravity mm -hmm. can do work and pull the foot down. Yep. And what kind of energy do we have right here when the foot is moving the fastest? That would be kinetic. That would be kinetic energy. So we might have a conversion of gravity energy to mm -hmm. kinetic energy, and then actually after it strikes the ball and the ball's moving out, we now have energy of the ball moving. Mm -hmm. and we also have some energy of the foot because it's still moving. Mm -hmm. So conservation of energy might say that the energy before, or the foot right before it hits the ball, ah, ah we lost our ball, <laughs> has to be equal to the energy, the combined energy of the ball and the foot mm -hmm. after the collision. All right. Any other ideas you think might be useful here? Probably a little bit to do with momentum. Momentum, right. So what, what does momentum mean in this case? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm don't not sure I know what momentum means, but momentum question. is something to do with the mass and the speed of the foot. Mm -hmm. All right. And we might say that the momentum of the foot before has to equal the momentum of the foot and the ball after the mm -hmm. collision. Okay. And we call that conservation of momentum. So conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, or perhaps Newton's laws as they describe forces and motions and things like that are some of the things that might be useful here. Mm -hmm. All right, now it's time to actually move on to a hypothesis. And one of the things about a hypothesis is, is that we define, we, we identify the variables and we actually try to predict what would happen if I change one variable to other variables. Mm -hmm. All right. So what do you think our hypothesis should be in this, in this situation? Well, I think it's going to make a difference how high we hold this, okay. the foot. How high you bring your foot up before you kick the ball. And the okay. higher you bring your foot up, the farther you're going to be able to kick the ball. So you're saying that there's a relationship between the initial height of the foot, mm -hmm. right, that's higher, that's lower, mm -hmm. and a relationship between that and how far the ball travels right. after it is kicked, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's try to be quantitative here. Let's say if I double the height of the ball, what of do you think foot? will happen? You mean double the height I'm of the sorry. foot? I'm sorry. Thank you. If I double the height of the foot. <laughs> double the height of the foot. <laughs> Got it. What will happen to quantitatively, what will happen to the distance the ball travels? Well, I'm kind of qualitative, but I think it, it'll go twice as far. You think it'll go twice, twice as far? Twice as high, twice as far. Okay. Very. So your, your hypothesis is, is that the distance the ball travel is proportional to the height of the foot. 
So if I double the height of the foot, I double the distance the ball traveled. Okay? I actually came up with a different hypothesis, and it may not be correct, but the whole idea of this teaching process is that if students make incorrect hypotheses, they take data and they see that they're incorrect and they revise them. So my hypothesis is, is that the distance the ball travels is proportional to the velocity of the ball right after it's kicked. The distance the ball traveled we're going to call x, you see on your screen, and the velocity of the ball right after being kicked we would call v. Okay? Uh, and before the collision, I have this other part of my hypothesis that says that the kinetic energy of the foot at the bottom of its motion, right before it hits the ball, is proportional to the height, the original height of the foot. Mm -hmm. right. So if I double the height of the foot, I double the kinetic energy of the foot right mm -hmm. before the collision. And if I Furthermore, I know that kinetic energy is related to velocity squared. It's one-half mass times velocity squared. So therefore, I think that the velocity squared of the ball after it's been kicked is going to be proportional to the height. And since the velocity is proportional to the distance, according to my hypothesis, mm -hmm. and it's also the velocity squared is propor proportional to the initial height, therefore, I say that the distance squared, the distance traveled squared, x squared, is proportional to the height. Now, we have we different have to, hypotheses right. because you're saying that the distance traveled is proportional to the height, uh -huh. and I'm saying that perhaps the distance squared travel is proportional to the height. And so, that's the whole idea of inquiry. Now we can actually do our experiment and see what happens here. And in doing so, notice that we used some variables here, mm -hmm. and in particular we have what we call an independent or manipulated variable. Which one is that? This one. Okay. Because we're going to hold it here. Right. One height, and then we'll have it at another height. All right. We've been calling Different that heights. H, which for stands for the height, the initial height to the foot. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have a dependent variable. So what's our dependent variable in this case? The distance at the ball. Goes. The distance the ball traveled, which we called x. And notice that we also have some things that we're calling constant variables, which is a strange term. But there are other things that we could vary, but we chose not to in this right. instance. What are some of the things that we could vary? Well, the mass of the, the, mass of the foot. We could, how much? we could change this mass right here and make it a more massive mm -hmm. or a less massive foot and see how that right. changes our experiment. We could also instead use a different ball that's squishy, but otherwise the same, instead of our ball that's very stiff and hard. Okay, So there are lots of things we could play with here. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the important tenets of science, of course, is that we don't change everything all at the same time. So that if we were to change the mass instead, we would always start from the same height and always use the same ball. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this instance, I think we're ready for multiple trials. And so what I mean by that is that I want to take my ball and I want to start the foot at some fixed height. Why don't you hold the ruler for me? And I want to let go and I want to measure how far the ball goes. It made a mark there. And then I want to do exactly the same thing as best I can nine more times so that I get ten 10 data points for that one set of variables, mm -hmm. manipulated and dependent. And that really leads into some nice opportunities for some math instruction. Mathematics. Could you tell us about that? Yes. Now, as we pursue our inquiry of kicking the ball, we can look at how data are represented. We can also describe data. And we can also interpret data. And the first way we might organize the data is in a table so that we would have our 30 data points. Remember, we did 10 trials at three different heights for this particular inquiry. Mm -hmm. And what we are showing you is just a part of one of the data tables. And we have the height and the distance recorded there. Now, this really doesn't give us a whole lot of information. 
Okay, we have these numbers. What, does it, what do they mean? So that's where we might decide, well, let's represent it as a bar graph. All right, and you can see here are all the data points we've collected in a bar graph. And you can see that, yes, indeed, as the height increases, the distance the ball travels goes farther. And that's pretty much all we can take from this bar graph. It's, it's actually a pretty chaotic way to organize the data. So let's take a look at an XY scatter plot. Now here we have three clusters of data points around each of the heights. And what's striking right away is that that first cluster around the very lowest height is very tightly compacted. Okay? And then as you look at the higher heights, where we've held the foot up higher, you can see there's more spread between the high point and the low point. There's more variability. This is a wonderful idea to discuss with students. By simply computing an average, which is what many students will do in this situation, you lose a whole lot of important information. And so that's where we want to look at other values of central tendency. We can look at the mode, the most frequent value. We can look at the median, and we can look at the mean. Whenever we have an outlier, one data point that's very different from the other data points, that's going to affect the mean. So in this kind of a setup, students are going to be able to look very critically at the mode, the median, and the mean in order to see which measure of central tendency is most useful. Okay, next slide. We can also begin to interpret the data, asking what if questions. What if we were to raise the foot much, much higher than our earlier trials? What would happen then? Okay, then we'd be extrapolating values beyond our data points. What if we were to raise the foot to a height in between some of the other data points? Then we would be interpolating. And of course, if you go back to the slide of the XY, thanks. Then we also want to look at what's the slope of a line that goes right through the middle of each of those clusters. And as we envi envision this line, it looks like it might be pretty straight. At it this looks point. like it might be pretty straight. And which hypothesis does that support? That's right, that supports <laughs> Jill's hypothesis. And hers was is that the distance the ball traveled, which is our vertical axis, is proportional to the height of the foot, which is our horizontal axis, right? which means that they should plot as a line, a straight line. And that's what the data supports. My hypothesis evidently was incorrect. <laughs> These what-if questions are very, very powerful and very, very important for students to consider and think about. And having this intuitive understanding of the slope is, again, another very powerful experience for students to try to connect the mathematics and the science. So we found as we work with this type of apparatus, doing this kind of inquiry with students, um, that there are three ways that students benefit. First of all, students begin to understand that mathematics is not just memorized steps. Secondly, students see that mathematics makes sense. It's not just a collection of arbitrary rules. And finally, they see math as a very useful tool for exploring their questions, questions that they're curious about and that they want to find answers to. And I would like to add that if one has a, a simple video camera and some inexpensive software, one can actually take a movie of the foot kicking the ball and then using the software pick the position of the foot and the ball for each frame of the movie and make graphs of the position of the foot and the position of the ball which I've shown here and then one act can, actually can, can model those. One can see if algebraic equations fit those data points mm -hmm. and infer information from that. So that's, that's a useful alternative tool or it can be used to check your inquiry process to see if you were correct. Yeah. It can lead to a much more precise interpretation of your data. Mm -hmm. So by showing you today the process of scientific inquiry and how mathematics can fit into it, hopefully we've shown you that teaching science inquiry is modeling the process by which scientists do, do science and also provides great opportunities for integration of mathematics and science instruction. 
For example, in this sense today with the World Cup soccer kicker, we were able to identify a hopefully meaningful context. By the way, colors of the Thai national team on the sock here. <laughs> All right. We've posed hypotheses or we've made mathematical conjectures. We've collected data. We've analyzed the data. And the data either supported our hypotheses or forced us to modify our <laughs> hypotheses. Graciously. Graciously, of course. And so to conclude, I think it's very important that we see if we can actually kick a goal with this thing. So I'm going to give it a, a large H, and we'll see. Are we ready? Ready. All right. Woo! Goal! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the live part of today's program. We have with us here Dr. Ken Doxey from Professor, he's a professor in the chemistry department at the University of Oregon. Welcome. Thank you. Um, many of you will recognize Dr. Dean Lively Brooks from his recent trip to Thailand. He's here um, from the physics department at the University of Oregon. Greetings. All right. And welcome to Dr. Jill Baxter from College of Education. And she's our math education specialist. Um, Delighted to be here. Nice to have you all on board. Um, we enjoyed watching both your, your lab session from the Green Chemistry Lab at the University of Oregon and your World Cup soccer kicker. We're going to give you both, all three an opportunity to talk a little bit about those things with us today. Let's start with Ken. Ken, um, in your videotape we saw you working in a lab, which is what most of us think about when we think of chemistry, but I know you've worked in some other interesting kinds of places too. Would you like to tell us about yeah, Absolutely. That? It's one yeah. of the most exciting things about the green chemistry program, I feel, is that it allows us to take experimental chemistry, and chemistry is an experimental subject, learned best, I think, in, the le in well, doing experiments. Mm -hmm. But we don't need to work in a traditional laboratory setting. The experiments are intrinsically safer. Mm -hmm. The hazards of exposure to chemicals are removed. So that we uh, at the University of Oregon, we work in a, in a laboratory that looks very old fashioned in that it has benches without lots of, of elaborate ventilation systems. Mm -hmm. um, and once we began working in that setting, we started thinking, well, you know, what other settings look like this? And, and one that came to mind was, was community colleges mm -hmm. or high schools that may not have, that probably don't have the expensive ventilation systems required for traditional experimentation. And then from that, we went one step further, and I have now been to, to Mexico and, and done four workshops for chemical educators there, mm -hmm. teaching green chemistry. And in these workshops, we have met in, in meeting rooms in, in resort hotels. Hotels, really? And uh, worked in one case on tables with the, the fancy blue tablecloth still in place. <laughs> uh, we did experiments, real wet chemistry for four hours. And when we finished, there was a knock on the door. The next group wanted to come in to sit down and listen to lectures. They weren't chemists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we cleared our materials out across the hall to, to clean up, and, and they sat and listened to lectures for an hour. So this and is not something you could normally do in a, a tr traditional chemistry setting. You'd be much more worried about safety issues. I think we would be much more worried about, about complaints as well, from, well. The, from the participants. It's unlikely they would have tolerated sitting in a traditional, even a, a ventilated laboratory setting after a, 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 a real experimental lab had been run. Good. So if this is something that could be done um, in, in Mexico, it could certainly be done in, in Thailand and, and elsewhere. I think the idea is to take your greener chemistry on the road and, and get it out there where it can be used as, in as many places as possible. Absolutely. We think it's the right way to teach chemistry, and it's very convenient that it's also a, a very simple way to teach chemistry. It does not require elaborate safety constraints. Okay. And I, I know you've uh, been thinking about some ways that that might happen between Oregon and Thailand. We think of them both as very... Uh, green places, both intrinsically because of all the the beautiful plant life, but um, I know both both areas, both locations are making efforts in the area of of green chemistry. I um, mean, you've been working on some antibiotic um, studies act activity. Is that the right word? Yes. Yeah? Yes. One of the experiments we do here is is focused on on using modern screening techniques to discover antibiotic activity. Mm -hmm. We work with with more traditional sorts of organic chemical approaches to making the compounds that we screen for activity. But one thing I'm very, very interested in working with through this Thai learning program, and perhaps with Dr. Supawan, 
is to uh, expand this experiment in a real research sort of way to have students in Thailand exploring antibiotic activity of, of plant extracts that form the basis of a, a, a number of Thai traditional medicines. Mm -hmm. So these are plants that you can find in the marketplace or perhaps even grow on the school grounds or, or in the community in which students are, are working. In perhaps, the, yes. Okay. And I'd be happy someday to come out and, and help, uh, help look for them. Yeah, that's exciting. That's a, that's a great idea. All right. Um, I know over on the, the physics and uh, math education side that uh, you, you two have also been thinking a lot about things that could take place in the domain of science with, with Thailand and University of Oregon. Uh, Dean, we really liked your, your World Cup soccer kicker. You wanna, what's it all about? Why, why the World Cup soccer kicker? <laughs> <laughs> well, my inspiration was actually uh, when I was visiting Thailand and driving between Bangkok and Hua Hin. Um, I looked out the window and saw some Thai children kicking the soccer ball around, and I thought, well, this is something that's very relevant to their everyday life. Mm -hmm. and, and while I was there, many people had told me that the science education has to be relevant to the student's life, that it can't be abstract. And so I thought, well, this, this is possibly an idea, and I'd been thinking about something called a ballistic pendulum, which uh, is, a, is a way that one measures the uh, kinetic energy of a, a projectile by basically shooting it into a pendulum and measuring the recoil. So a bullet. And, a yeah, a bullet or something okay. like that. And so this is sort of a ballistic pendulum in reverse. Without and the bullets. Without the bullets. <laughs> yeah, sounds a little safer. Don't want any bullets, <laughs> <laughs> right? And and I I designed this apparatus so that it would be very easy to make. Um, I actually took my wife's old bicycle and tore it apart to make this thing. And so I think one could make one of these apparatus quite easily. And I actually put the information about how to do that on the web page. Uh, that's that you, you have it linked up. So. Good. Well, we'll be giving that website address at the at the end of today's session mm -hmm. too. So mm -hmm. that's great. So so this is something you could just sort of look around your community or your area, get an old old bicycle, tear it down, take it apart, and mm -hmm. even I could build a World Cup you soccer could, kicker. You could build a World Cup <laughs> soccer kicker, and of course, having the World Cup just finished now, it's uh, obviously, I think, still in people's minds, you know, the idea of soccer. But there's, you know, one of the ideas is that there's lots of physics in the world around us. There's soccer, there's playgrounds, there's bicycles, there's things like that, and all those use principles of physics, and so we don't have to you know, use exotic uh, apparatus or anything mm -hmm. like that. We can find things around us and teach physics just as easily. And have fun. And have fun. Yeah, and I like that. And do it in an inquiry fashion as well. Yeah. You brought one of your balls with you today. Oh, of course. Yeah. Is it the hard one Never or the go squishy well one? That. This is the squishy one, and that <laughs> makes the physics a little bit more difficult to do, actually, but uh, it's good to challenge students like that. Sure, yeah. and ourselves, too. Yeah. 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 Well, you and Jill uh, challenged each other. You did a really nice job um, in your demonstration that you did for the viewers here today of, of modeling some sort of back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you did it sort of spontaneously, uh, choosing two different hypotheses, um, one of which you, you knew uh, was correct and one of which you knew was going to be wrong. But it very much modeled sort of what we expect to see from our students. So in traditional education, uh, you would have a very rigid structure for conducting an experiment and mm -hmm. students would follow along lockstep and when you were done, boy, you had really learned some physics that day. And um, this approach looked like a lot of fun. Um, you've been working together for a number of years and, and I know your angle is, is, is the math. How does the math fit in with the physics in, in this case? Well, in this case, the mathematics can be a very powerful tool for helping children pursue questions that are interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And what the research suggests is that we really want to help children generate, pose interesting questions that they then find ways to answer, with our help, of course, right. you know, so that we help them develop fairly rigorous um, mathematical and analytical tools. And so that's what we were trying to do with the World Cup um, soccer kicker is show how some very simple mathematical tools, median, ra mode, range, slope, could help children make sense of this apparatus and what's, you know, their predictions. And the research again suggests that we want as much as possible to ground children's explorations in mathematics and science in a context that's familiar to them as opposed to some abstract list of steps they go through to get a right answer. 
Okay, and when you're when you're saying children's, I think it's fair to substitute the word students for that yes. too. What's, what's really beautiful yes. about the demonstration that you gave us is, is this is something that you can scale to a wide range of ages. Mm -hmm. And so um, I could imagine not only primary school, but right. um, secondary school, and even university students um, experimenting yeah. with this. And with this inquiry-based approach, is it is it fair to say um, you're still guiding um, the direction that they're going, but uh, but you modeled the sort of making of mistakes. Dean, would you like to talk about that? Um, you deliberately put forth a hypothesis that you knew was was maybe not quite correct. Um, why did you do that? <laughs> I had to think about that yeah. for quite a while. This is not a not a trivial, you know, uh, experiment from the physics point of view. Um, and so I, I think it's just nature, natural, that students would make an incorrect hypothesis. Mm -hmm. and, and indeed, scientists do it all the time, and they have to fix them as they go along. Mm -hmm. And so that's really part of modeling science as a process, you know, in in an authentic way, that um, you can make a wrong hypothesis, and you need to practice the process of figuring out that it's a wrong hypothesis, and you need to practice fixing your own hypotheses and things like that, and and making them more correct or more universally applicable. Um, so that was that was intentional on our part, and. Uh, but but I think that any any teacher in any classroom would recognize that many of their students are going to come to the table with a misconception mm -hmm. that would lead to an uh, incorrect hypothesis, and the idea is not to step on it right away. I know we all want to do that, but instead to let them run with it for a little while and learn for themselves that it's incorrect, and and then take action from there. And is there research to back that up, Joe? Well, I was just going to say we want students to be to make claims, conjectures, hypotheses, mm -hmm. and then to be able to gather evidence to support or disconfirm their claim, conjecture, hypothesis. And that's where the real power comes in as far as students learning. I think we, the vast majority of students can memorize how to get a right answer. Mm -hmm. But what's far more important is what they do when they don't know how to get a right answer. And that's what we're really trying to support in this inquiry stance. It's as much about the process right. as the end product. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Right. Well, I think that nicely sums up what um, all of us are working toward um, with greener chemistry, with physics, and with the math education. And we're hoping to have an opportunity to work more with um, all three of you and your colleagues as well, both here at the university and um, out in Thailand. And we look forward to more uh, soccer kicker type experiments <laughs> and um, innovative greener chemistry in the future. So thank you very much um, for joining us thank today. You, you. We'll look forward thank to hearing you. more from you. What we'd like to do at this point in the program is conclude with some scenes from Her Royal Highness's recent visit here on campus. Uh, we thank you very much for following along with us here today and we hope to have a chance to work with you um, in Thailand or in Oregon, wherever your travels may take you in reality or virtually. And with that, we say kokumaka and sawadika, and, and thank you, and please join us again.